Hello, I'm Miles Standish, Vice President of NGC. I'm going to be speaking here today with Edmund Moy, um, the 38th U.S. Mint Director of the United States Mint, also an autograph signer exclusively for NGC in our encapsulated numismatic program. So Ed, I want to ask you, how did you get in the coin industry? Good in the question. Coin? Good question, Miles. Uh, my first memory of collecting a coin when I was about 10 years old working in my parents' restaurant. My parents were legal immigrants. My dad was fleeing the communist takeover in China. He came over here with no skills, ended up uh, falling in with some restaurant friends and started restaurants as his way of making a living. And in a Chinese family, uh, the family is an economic unit, so you trust the family with the money. So that meant as soon as I could add, subtract, multiply, and uh, divide, I was at the cash register. But as a 10-year-old kid, um, you know, my attention was just all over the place. So in downtime, I would check the change drawer and look for really unique coins. And when I found one, like a buffalo nickel or even an Indian head penny was fairly common back in those days, I would switch it out with a, a modern version of that coin, and that's how my coin collection got started. Little did I know that uh, you know, 40 years later, I would become the director of the United States Mint. I mean, that only happens in America. It's a fabulous story. Starting from a 10-year-old, starting out at the cash register, to running the world's largest mint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and it was just a, a privilege to do it uh, in that the mint is one of the oldest institutions in America. It was authorized by the U.S. Constitution. It was started in 1792. Uh, the first mint director was David Rittenhouse, who was a famous scientist in Philadelphia. And just to be part of that lineage is just beyond my dreams. What is it, Ed, you like about working with precious metal coins? Mm. Precious metals in my family have had a long connection with each other, most of it being cultural. When my mom got married, her wedding gift was a bracelet and necklace made out of 24 karat gold. And the necklace had uh, 10 $5 gold pieces, U.S. gold pieces, and the bracelet had 10 of uh, $2.5 U.S. gold pieces. And what was um, important about that was if you were looking at it from a uh, Western perspective, you would say, boy, they're welcoming a new person into the family. But from a cultural perspective, it had deep meaning. What my uh, paternal grandfather was saying was my family survived the fall of Imperial China and the rise of the warlords. The fall of the warlords, the rise of the nationalists. The fall of the nationalists, the rise of the communists. And all through that time, multiple banking systems, multiple currencies, Japanese invading during World War II. And so what my uh, paternal grandfather was saying is, I want you to wear enough wealth around your neck and your wrist that if you had to run out of your house because you were being attacked, you would have enough money to keep my family line going. And that was my earliest memory of uh, precious metals was looking at my mom's necklace and knowing that there were only a few coins left that she had to sell them to get out of Hong Kong in order to come here. Yeah, it wasn't just about preserving wealth in the family, mm -hmm. but it was that whole future families yes. that needed to be protected to continue on is what your grandfather wanted to have accomplished. Absolutely, and you're seeing that all over Asia now. Mm -hmm. uh, the largest uh, gold sales are going to India and China because you're getting these uh, people in poverty making it in the middle class and having all this um, income that they never had before and they're being able to buy precious metal because they want to have some portable wealth around them. Yeah, the American compared to the Eastern believes a little bit about having gold and silver or sound money, where the East believes about protecting the whole family for yeah. generations to come. Yeah. A little bit different perspective, and I think we forget that in this country. Yeah, but gold coins are important in this country. When I was the director of the U.S. Mint, was during the financial crisis, and we saw gold bullion coins sales go from 200,000 ounces a year to 1.4 million ounces a year from 2006 to 2011. That's a 700% increase in the amount of gold bullion coins. And where are they all going? Well, they're mainly going to U.S. individual investors.
because okay. they don't have the same uh, access to uh, sophisticated financial derivatives to hedge against inflation like an institution does. And so gold and silver, they've worked for uh, 5,000 years. That's a pretty safe place to park your money when things get shaky. And after now 35 years of the Eagle program, you know, there's been this constant thirst, both for Americans and globally, to own both gold and silver Eagles mm -hmm. because of the popularity of them, the strength of them, um, and what be people believe in. And it's been a, a phenomenal market that's been created by the U.S. Mint and under your tenure, it even grew even larger mm -hmm. over time. But that incredible thirst, though, it's just amazing when you think about none of the coins have been spent, none of them have been lost at sea, but there's this constant weekly demand, daily demand, yearly demand for those in that important series that started over 35 years ago. Sure. Phenomenon. Yep, and you know, there's plenty of great bullion makers out there. The Cougarand started in South Africa. That mm -hmm. was the first true bullion coin. Right. Uh, and very popular. But the United States has really taken over, particularly under my tenure, uh, because in the era of, of uh, financial uncertainty, uh, you want coins made by uh, someone that you can re really rely on. Just like countries rely on the U.S. dollar as their, US, uh, as their reserve currency, if you're going to uh, buy gold or silver, you want it made from the United States Mint, which uh, it has a huge market here in the United States, but as you said, is growing worldwide just because of its reputation. Well, one of the releases obviously was the expansion of the Mint products coming out with the 2006 Buffalo, mm -hmm. the time when you started at the Mint, um, and was made in 24 karat to appeal to those global buyers yep. that wanted even the higher yep. fineness of gold contained in each coin. Right. Yeah, and so we made some good judgments and bad judgments on that. The good one was, yes, there was a market for 24 karat gold products, mm -hmm. and the rest of the global mints have followed along with uh, some of them have made uh, 24 karat gold products, and those have sold. But what we also found was the uh, Asian investors, uh, they want the least amount of markup, which is why jewelry makes so much sense for them. Mm -hmm. Jewelry is portable, so you wear that around your neck. You get to go to a party and show off saying, I've made it to the middle class, and and here's one reason you can't do that with gold coins. And then uh, mint cost to manufacture a coin uh, add to the premium. And the uh, premium to make a ch gold chain is much smaller. So when you get to these markets in Asia, you're seeing a big difference now where uh, the, uh, the buyers, because they've gone from lower middle class to middle class, uh, they want to buy as much gold as they can, and they don't want to pay manufacturing costs, which is why simple jewelry sells much better in those countries. But when you want an uh, investment product, you can't trade that in um, because it has to be assayed and a whole bunch of other stuff. You want something that's easily recognizable and fungible, which uh, that's where government-made bullion coins becomes a big advantage. Well, when they came out with the Buffalo, that was to take on some foreign mints, four nine gold coins yep. canadian maple leaf perth had a coin yep. um do you think it it would have had been more successful even though you were trying to appeal to the globe to keep those premiums low had it been three nines mm -hmm. just like the gold eagle program would it have been more successful you know that's on a, a good, volume basis that's a good question based on the data uh, i think it, there might have been slightly more successful but bottom line is you don't have the display Part of it, you know, so both in the Chinese and the Indian cultures, there's something called face, which is your outward mm -hmm. perception, and uh, to wear gold uh, is a uh, is an important way of saying you've really arrived. Uh, coins are really hard to wear. Mm -hmm. I am not going to let this opportunity to go by without asking you a couple questions, and one of the things that is on my mind is. Uh, when you look at graded coins, and I know under my tenure, we created a lot of bullion coins that ended up grading 70, which was uh, mm -hmm. kind of amazing. What's the difference between a 70 and a 69? I mean, how do you distinguish between the two? Well, typically, I would say one point. <laughs> but really, right, what it, go a little deeper than that. A little deeper than that. You know, in the, in the technical sense, when a numismatic expert at NGC 
looks at a gold eagle or a buffalo or a silver eagle, um, you know, you visually look at that coin naked eye just to, if you immediately see anything on that coin as some form of dam I call it word damage, but any kind of contact abrasion or hairline on the proofs, mm -hmm. um, it gets eliminated from 70 um, very quickly. That way, if you can see something instantly, it's not gonna make it. Right. Um, but after a little bit of further examination, if you haven't seen anything with both the naked eye, um, the amount of magnification that's used to look at that coin is really no more than five power or five X um, uh, of a magnifying uh, source. Um, and that is, um, it's still, you know, checking out the whole coin, both front and back. Um, and if you still don't find anything after examining both sides, that coin would elevate to the 70 grade mm -hmm. in both proof and uncirculated condition. Mm -hmm. But it's that, you know, you know, and I've done this for over 35 years of my career, examined and graded over, over 10 million coins. Um, it's pretty, it's amazing. I think most people usually think in my line of work, it's all about magnification. Um, I've always been blessed with really good vision. Uh, from a young age, obviously, there's a certain point in your life where you know I, you know, I use you know a pair of glasses. Um, but I was 2010 most of my grading years, um, working in the grading room uh, every day. Um, but most things can be identified quickly on a modern U.S. minted eagle or buffalo coin um, to eliminate that coin, but it's that further examination that we look for. And, and, and using the five power magnification, um, you should be able to find anything else. So let me tell you a little bit of backstory from the other side. Uh, so when I became Mint Director um, and the financial crisis happened, we saw the escalation in, um, in the uh, demand for bullion coins, so we had to make more. Uh, because the government guarantees the uh, weight, content, purity of those coins, and we're going to uh, really escalate the production, uh, the volume of production, I spent a little bit of time in Japan meeting with my counterpart over there, the uh, head of the Japan Mint, because uh, the Japanese are really known for their fastidious, precise quality control. And I wanted to, our manufacturing team to learn from them uh, certain techniques that would not only improve the quality, even as we increase volume of our bullion coins, but also our numismatic products. And uh, so, uh, you know, one of the attitudes that I found a little disconcerting among some at the Mint was uh, when I talked about quality, I would always get a couple snickers from you know, the peanut gallery and I'd ask why, and he said, well, we're the only organization in the world where when we make a mistake, it's uh, worth more money than what the face value of the yeah, coin true. is, right? <laughs> but then I countered by saying, well, if coins are an extension of America's identity and we make mistakes that get out of here, what that says is America's comfortable with second-class work. And I want us to really focus on first-class work. I want every coin out here to be perfect if we right. can make that right. and do it economically. And so as a result, uh, I, th I think that has uh, contributed to the number of 70s that, uh, that you're getting in the market today. Well, the quality, of, the quality has improved with probably technology at the Mint, yep. manufacturing machines that make those coins. You know, in my position, I've always gotten to be the umpire for the world's largest mint mm -hmm. and, and, and most respected yeah. mint, the U.S. mint, mm -hmm. you know, the mint puts out everything thinking it's perfect, and I get to be the guy that says it's not. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's uh, it's it's uh, it's always been a little joy of being able to look at coins and 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 decipher that differences, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been a lifetime for me, of course. Yeah. So Ed, what has been your experience in working with United States Gold Bureau and your autograph coin program? United States Gold Bureau uh, is an exclusive provider of several Ed Moy signature products, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm proud to provide. And when I work on those labels, um, I take extra care in the signature. So, you know, when you sign labels, it might sound like an easy living, but it's actually really hard work. Uh, you know, so many people ask me, uh, so you get paid for just auto penning? I go, no. When you look at the bottom of that label, it says authentic, hand-signed. So I personally sign each one of those. 
And when you sign them, um, you need to also make sure that there's some consistency in the signature so it's easily recognizable. And when you're signing a whole sheet, uh, so I sign sheets of labels, and then uh, NGC is able to uh, print the information on them and then put the label uh, inside the capsule. Well, when you sign 40 sheets, uh, it's easy to get lazy and the first signature will be much better than the last signature. But for me, uh, because it's my name on it, I wanna make sure that that signature looks just the same as the first one, as the 40th one, and as I shine the 1,000th sheet. Uh, that they all, all, all should look that way. And so it's something I take great pride in because I know that um, having a, a signature on a coin, on a graded coin, um, adds value uh, uh, to that coin. I mean, one of the great things about graded coins is that it's standardized and commoditized uh, values of, of coins. And I think uh, we've gone far from the early days of my collecting where you had some self-proclaimed expert say, well, that's brilliant uncirculated. Right. Someone's brilliant uncirculated is different than somebody else's brilliant uncirculated. But grading has taken a lot of that guesswork, particularly as the populations have increased. But then you have the question, now everything's commoditized, how do you differentiate value uh, right. between the commoditized products? Well, uh, the signature programs uh, are one way to do that. And I'm really thankful for your pioneering work uh, in that uh, because you've uh, changed the industry from a novelty to a real business that creates long-term value that stays in a secondary market. And uh, so uh, my experience uh, working for the uh, US Gold Bureau uh, with our, the signature program is that um, you know, they're an exclusive provider, and I'm really proud of the work that they do. Yeah, the idea originated, obviously, from the idea of having a authentic coin with solid certification and grading with an authentic hand-signed signature, which made it the double play mm -hmm. of collectibles. Yep. Because, they, obviously, the world has the thirst for both gold and silver and metals, but, but also the, that market with the autograph market, which I've had experience in, and combining them together was the way to put them all together in the same package without a facsimile autograph or a, or a as you said, uh, you know, a machine-generated autograph, um, but to make it really authentic so that the collector and the owner of these coins would be getting a real collectible. Mm -hmm. Everything about it is real. Yep. and important and and you know that painstaking effort to sign signature kind of reminds me of uh, uh, kind of reminds me of my school days talking in class and you know having to write on the chalkboard I you know yes. I will not talk in class again Which you might have done yeah I might have done yeah. that at least three or four hundred times <laughs> <laughs> and believe me I, I slowed down on that <laughs> didn't perfect it but uh, it, it, it is that tedious I know mm -hmm. uh, some people you know we barely write checks anymore but if you ever have to write a lot of checks you'll find that it's not yeah. that enjoyable it's mm -hmm. just something you do mm -hmm. to produce that authentic collectible mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, what I'm impressed with is how um, the program's gone from just like a novelty to there, there's a robust aftermarket that keeps mm -hmm. the values up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people have that. People have that thirst for certified autograph coins, as well as they have that thirst for eagles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know by the production of the U.S. Mint. You know, when they when they have large protections because that thirst is so large and the autographs have expanded right with it right. and the popularity. Ed, how did you decide to use the work of Augustus St. Gaudens at the U.S. Mint 2009? Good question, Miles. And selfishly, it, um, it stems from my childhood collecting. So when I collected uh, coins, uh, and you look at all the ones that I pulled out of the cash register, they all came from 1907 to about 1933. They were uh, Lincoln pennies, you know, which was easy. I remember putting them in the blue books. Uh, it was Buffalo nickels. It was the Mercury dime, the, um, the Standing Liberty uh, with the shield uh, for the quarters, um, the um, Adolph Weinman, we are Walking Liberty for the 50 cent piece. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I couldn't afford at the time uh, because the only way you could get a eagle or a double eagle 
was you had to have enough money to buy gold. Sure. Right? And so as a kid, I just couldn't, couldn't afford that. And so when I became a mint director, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was I figured there would be a lot of people like me. And if I could uh, make uh, the eagle or double eagle uh, the way that was originally intended to be made and made that available to modern day collectors, uh, that would be a great way to fill my collection. You know, and I have one of the uh, 2009 Ultra High Relief uh, in my own collection uh, because that's who I was kind of the customer that I was uh, thinking about it. But you know, the more I uh, spent time at the Mint, uh, what I also saw was a drifting away from the rich symbolism that uh, and the story that our coins told, and more toward uh, you know just uh, you know the half profile of a person and a bunch of symbols of power uh, of the state and in the back. And when I uh, researched Augustus St. Gons, I found out that he had this partnership with Teddy Roosevelt, who was president at the time, who was also a coin collector. And Roosevelt believed that coins were an extension of a country's identity. And he was mulling over this idea that America has now been around. It survived the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War, things that could have brought down our country. And we weren't going to disappear overnight. So America deserves coins that are uniquely American. And he believed that if you looked at our coins, you would say we were uniquely European. And so he uh, collaborated with Augustus St. Gaudens to create uh, coins that not only looked American, but were adequate ambassadors for what America was. And so the, uh, the double eagle uh, that's now famous was Augustus St. Gaudens, uh, one of his two projects. He worked on the eagle and, and the double eagle. And, uh, you know, it's just, it talks about America. I mean, that coin says more about our country than any other coin says about their country. Uh, when you look at it, uh, first of all, it is a full frontal of, of liberty, her full figure. There's no coin with a full figure on it. It's always the head of the leader. Second, she's dressed in a Greek Roman gown with the argument that St. Gaudens was making that our modern freedoms have roots in Western civilization, in Greek and Roman philosophy. Uh, she's carrying a torch in her front, lighting her way, and carrying an olive branch behind her. The symbolism behind that is if you were a Christian back in those days, you would uh, view the torch as the lamp of God. Or if you weren't, you would say that it was enlightenment, like what the French were doing. Uh, the olive branch was quite simply peace. So the symbolism here is where God or enlightenment leads liberty and liberty follows, then peace will come, peace and prosperity will come to that country. And when you look below, uh, she is climbing up a mountain, and below her is the U.S. Capitol. And what St. Gaudens was saying there was, the first place that this modern notion of liberty and freedom has visited is the United States, symbolized by the shining city on a hill, the people's uh, uh, legislative body. And now she was marching forcefully into the rest of the world. Uh, and St. Gons built that into the coin by using high relief. So she's marching so forcefully that she's busting out of the coin into the viewer's face. And when you look at the reverse of the coin, there's a sunrise with a young bald eagle that hasn't got its white crown yet. And St. Gons was quite simply saying that uh, America was a very young country at the very beginning of its day. Well, that, the ideas behind that coin and the design just revolutionized uh, people's thinking about what coins could really do to educate the population, remind the population of what its values were. In the past, coins, going back to Rome and Greece, were uh, reminders of this is the leader and this is the money that comes from him and uh, it's because of that money 
that your livelihood is dependent upon him. Completely different uh, way of looking at coins. And so I wanted Americans to be able to own that. Uh, and, and that's why I decided to uh, recreate that. The other uh, part of this that uh, I wanted to do was when I got to Mint, to the United States Mint, uh, we had very low morale. And uh, when you look at, uh, there's a survey called the Best Places to Work Survey, which is done by the Partnership for Public Service. Uh, every federal employee has to take it, and they have to self-rank their part of government as far as the best places to work. There are 217 parts of government. The Mint ranked 211. When you got there. When I got there. So I needed to come up with something to galvanize the Mint and raise the morale and spirit. And uh, this was the coin that was going to be able to do it because um, in order to do it, and mass produce it, which they couldn't back in 1907, uh, we had to invest in a lot of new cutting edge technologies like digital design. So um, we were able to uh, use high def cameras, capture the original best um, plaster that St. Gaudens did, and copy it right down to the last pixel. Mm -hmm. And then we needed to transfer that instead of using a Jean Vier, which is an old fashioned uh, French reducing machine. Die maker. Uh, die maker. And uh, we could then transfer that image directly to a cutting tool that would cut the dies. Mm -hmm. Right? So you lose nothing in the translation. Uh, but then we also uh, had to make it, uh, you know, the original coin, um, given the presses at the time, you couldn't get the high relief unless you stamp the coin eight to 11 times. But you couldn't line up the coin except by eye. So you can imagine how many errors came out of that, Absolutely. right? Uh, and very few uh, came out um, good enough for circulation. And you just can't make a mass market coin. Uh, that would have been the equivalent of a $100 bill back then. You just couldn't make enough of those that way. And we at the Mint had to figure all that stuff out. And that really brought everyone together. And I'm, uh, one of the things that I, as I reflect back, as a personal amount of satisfaction was after our ultra high relief, uh, our uh, morale jumped from uh, with, uh, about 210 or so uh, up to 58. Really? That was the biggest jump in the history of that survey of any uh, part of the government. Well, your enthusiasm for Augustus St. Gaudens' work of 1907, obviously fast forward to 2009, really resonates with me and obviously it shows the great passion you had for his work. Um, I actually had an opportunity to handle the two existing pieces mm. from 1907 that happened to be in the Smithsonian archives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, they're just fabulous. They got those right. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I didn't see any of the other strikes, but just those two coins exist in the archives at the Smithsonian Institute. But you know, the you know the story of uh, you know uh, Miss Liberty coming at you like that. It's it's kind of like the uh, you know modern day action figure of you know the Avengers and Captain America coming at you. Wonder Woman. Yeah, yeah exactly. All that, um, and it's fabulous. But the way that you tell the story, obviously is always been, in my opinion, the best description ever for the coin. Mm. And no, no better than for you to have that description mm. because you had so much passion for it. Mm -hmm. You know, you championed it and made it happen at the U.S. Mint in modern, modern time with modern equipment. Um, but, uh, you know, right down to, uh, you know, that, that, that shiny city on the hill. Of course, as you mentioned, you know, it's from a Bible. Yep. Later, later, we all recall that from a Ronald Reagan yep. speech mm -hmm. that I... Yep. Calling Present. America the shining city on the hill. Exactly. Um, but, you know, even um, to the reverse of that coin, uh, talking about, you know, a young bald eagle. And even for a numismatist like myself that's looked at, you know, millions of coins in my lifetime, understanding that concept of how that eagle matures into having a white crown mm -hmm. um, and that coin not having it because America is a young country at the time. So, you know, it's just a fabulous description. I've always appreciated it. And it, it really shows how much you really had so much passion for getting that coin right uh, for the United States Mint in 2009. Well, you know, I really love our country. And I think our country has a great story. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a great collaboration between a president 
who wanted coins to reflect his country's values versus his own power. And so this is a big departure. And, uh, and as the Mint Director, I kind of inherited the mantle of trying to continue that, which is why we tried so many different innovations and put a lot more emphasis on artistic excellence. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, you know, it's amazing when we talk about our, our young country and, and uh, you know, we're entering this year into our 245th birthday. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't recall, you know, recognize that and realize that's where we're at. And, uh, you know, it reminds me of the bicentennial year, where, bicentennial year, you know, where will I be in 2050? And we're, yeah. and we're getting close to that. Absolutely. Or actually, yeah. in, in 2026, mm -hmm. you know, we're getting so close to that 250th birthday. But uh, no, it's a great, great patriotic story, a true American story and through coinage. Mm. Um, the uh, St. Gaudens didn't stop there. He also did the eagle. Mm -hmm. And the eagle features a, um, a side portrait of Liberty. And what's different is she has an Indian headdress on her. And what he was also saying by that was um, uh, this version of liberty that we're currently living in today in America uh, is uniquely American. It wasn't the liberty that the Greek and Romans, even though they came up with this idea, it wasn't the liberty that they lived in. Uh, and so he wanted to make sure that uh, the, the, the liberty that was here was represented in a unique way to America. And you just don't have Native American headdresses anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was also having a subtle signal there of a theory that uh, he had gravitated to about what made America its own unique country. And he was trying, to, uh, the historians at the time were trying to figure out, uh, you know, 250 years earlier when they were building uh, uh, in Philadelphia Row or, uh, or in Boston, uh, those cities uh, look like their versions of Europe. But the further you moved west, the more uniquely American those cities started to look. Because you can't find Revolutionary War uh, homes in Chicago or Milwaukee or, or Denver. Um, and so there was this theory going around that what made America into her own unique identity was the land and our ability to, um, uh, to go westward and uh, fully experience the land. And that's why Roosevelt wanted to uh, start the National Parks Program. There were no national parks until then. And he believed that every American ought to have an experience in the pure American wilderness uh, as, their form, as a way to form their citizenship. And so uh, that's why the Native American was used is that that's what you encountered when you went west. Now there's a lot of bad history around uh, how Americans treated Native Americans and, and that type of thing, but uh, the broader theory still stands in that uh, that was part of what forged a unique American identity. And that's what came out in St. Gordon's coins and then he had a number of acolytes, right? Uh, James Earl Frazier, um, who did the Buffalo Nickel. Now that you understand frontier theory, you understand why he put a Native American on the front and a bison on the back, mm -hmm. right? Was to re-emphasize that. Uh, when you look at uh, what's the so-called Mercury Dime, which is really Liberty, but uh, she has wings uh, in the band around her head, and those wings symbolize freedom of thought. Right, uh, not Mercury, the goddess of, of uh, w w whatever, uh, the uh, the standing Liberty quarter, or even the uh, on the Silver Eagle, you have the uh, walking Liberty, and that was uh, Liberty draped in an American flag, at a sunrise, uh, walking forward. That uh, this would be a forward movement, not a static movement, and so all those uh, ideas came from St. Gaudens and Roosevelt's original um, thinking through what coins should do for their country. Yeah, because a lot of them were mentored by St. Gaudens. Yep. Mm -hmm. And they learned from him that style yeah. Yeah. and that emphasis on Yeah, America. they all worked in the same studio. Mm -hmm. So Ed, I'm gonna say with complete certainty of anyone on the planet that you're the only person that has been inside Fort Knox 
and inside the Texas Bullion Depository. Mm. So what do you think of the importance, the availability for Americans or Texans to store gold at the Texas Gold Depository? Mm -hmm. Great question, Miles. And I think you're right. Uh, I've certainly been in Fort Knox, and I don't recall any mint director ever uh, being at the Texas Bullion Depository. Uh, both of them uh, hold a unique place in my heart. Uh, one is being one of the very few people to be able to uh, visit Fort Knox because that was part of my job. Uh, I didn't do the ceremonial, I went there once and then never went back again because I saw it. But I, I cared about the, our employees there. And so during my time as Mint Director, I made multiple visits each year to our facility in, in Fort Knox just to make sure our team was doing well. Because that's a unique assignment. When you're assigned in Fort Knox, you're basically working in a submarine. Is Odd Job still there? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if anybody knows the movie from James Bond. Yeah, right. I always wanted to meet, I just had, I wanted nope. to catch the hat once. <laughs> yeah, and it's not multiple floors, with open cages. You know, so Ed, you know, most people that have seen some of the James Bond movies have, have obviously seen Goldfinger. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people have a thought that when they watch that movie, they've already seen what Fort Knox looks like in the inside. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe if you could maybe give a little bit of your uh, description of, of uh, your multiple visits to Fort Knox and give, mm -hmm. give people a chance to get a little bit of a better yeah. idea of that. Yeah, and there's only so much I can tell you, Miles, otherwise you'd have, You'd have to, to kill, kill you, and, <laughs> and we'd lose one of the world's greatest graders. So. <laughs> right. um, uh, compared to Goldfinger the movie, Fort Knox looks the same from the outside. It's just this little white building on top of a mound, uh, uh, and, and that's Fort Knox, but uh, it goes much deeper than that. Fort Knox was built to store all the gold that um, Roosevelt, in essence, confiscated from Americans in 1933. And he needed a place to put all that gold. And so they figured the safest place, given the technology at the time, was to make it inland America and put it in the middle of a military fort. Uh, and so that's, that's why Fort Knox was, was, was chosen. And to me, it's been amazing because uh, when you go in there as a uh, as a person who loves uh, history and coinage, uh, you can see a lot of the gold bars that are stored in gold at, at Fort Knox. Uh, they're dirty. So when you go to like the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and look at the uh, bullion vaults that they have there, uh, they're all new 400 ounce uh, good delivery bars that are shiny because gold doesn't corrode. So why does this gold look dirty um, and rusted and, uh, um, and, and basically old. It's right? oxidization over time yes. sitting. Of the um, other metals that were put into gold coins at the time to make them stronger. Mm -hmm. And so that percentage, whether it was bronze, silver, or you know, whatever mix, when Roosevelt got it, uh, he took those coins and melted them down into these bars and put them in Fort Knox. And so most of the bars in Fort Knox are what we call coin bars, which are these discolored uh, bars that are there. He stored the 10 1933s uh, in Fort Knox, as well as other things during World War II for other countries. You know, so it's a great historical facility that not many people have had a chance to experience firsthand. Yeah, there's different great assets over the time of Fort Knox that have been sto mm -hmm. stored there yep. from the stories that I've heard. I don't know if the Magna Carta may have been stored there or the, you know, the Constitution. with death again. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'll leave it alone. <laughs> I'll leave it alone. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, most people don't realize that the most, most countries and banks around the world, when they trade gold amongst each other physically, it's in 400 ounce bars. Yes. And, and those are on demand and what they require to participate in that. And I think that's mm -hmm. almost on, on the COMEX the same way, yep. but it's in 400 ounce bars. So if you can yeah. imagine, you know, how heavy those are on an individual basis. There are uh, 26 and a half pounds a piece. Well, I asked the right guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> and um, uh, since then, uh, Fort Knox has diversified its facilities. So it still holds roughly half of America's gold reserves. 
but the other parts are evenly split between uh, Denver and uh, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, uh, West Point. It's split between two other uh, Mint facilities, so it's not all in one facility. Simply stated, when you're the U.S. Mint Director, you're over Fort Knox as well yes. as the United States Mint. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people realize that, the, the duties and responsibilities of a Mint Director. Yeah. Um, and you said that's a military base that's, that really, it, Fort Knox, Kentucky, that is the, the security team for Fort Knox. That's right. And I take it there's probably the arm of the Mint Police yes. that also uh, you know, guard the different mints throughout our country mm -hmm. um, that manufacture coins, but the Fort Knox facility works the same way mm -hmm. under the heading of the U.S. Mint Director. Yep, and I remember my, uh, my first visit, uh, I wanted to pay a courtesy visit to the commanding officer of Fort Knox just because I'm on his territory, even though this land has been uh, given to the mint to use to build the bullion depository. So how did that tour go with uh, the military when you visited <laughs> Fort Knox? I don't know what you want to talk about or not. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, first of all, um, I had, uh, there's not a lot of hotels around Fort Knox. It's mainly a military So town. you're a barracks kind of guy. Yeah, <laughs> well, and the, uh, the, uh, the base officer, um, uh, I was able to use their guest house. So um, it's, it's, it was great to be woken up by two staff sergeants that uh, had your breakfast. They were cooking it in your kitchen, and you could just smell the bacon as you were headed to the shower. And so they uh, they, they treat their people really well. That was, so that was that was woken up by a bugle call of some sort. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but uh, there's also complications because uh, when you have employees there, um, they have to come in and out of the base. There's all that security. They have to go in and out of uh, the Fort Knox Bullion Depository, which there's added in more complex security. And so what you basically want is you want them in the building for as long as possible. Um, and that means multiple days stays uh, for some of them, uh, just because it's easier. And they cook there, they bring their food there, etc. They're kind of like firefighters <laughs> where they work multiple days on, multiple days yep. off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just so, and that just as an employee, it brings a whole host of other issues that you have to uh, be cognizant of, boredom, uh, you know, when you have a facility like that, so you, everyone, you have to figure out ways to keep everyone sharp all the time. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it was a privilege uh, to be there and a pleasant um, part of the portfolio of what the Mint Director provides oversight and, um, uh, and direction to yeah it's it i always found it to be an amazing thing it had to be a great honor obviously not to just be the 38th u.s mint director mm -hmm. but over so many mints over the, you know wide you have west point philadelphia san francisco denver yep. um and then of course fort knox as a facility is the gold vault yeah uh, just a tremendous honor well and that's why it was really interesting that when uh, U.S. Gold Bureau and uh, Texas Tangible Assets uh, came to me uh, after Texas had passed a legislation and Governor Abbott had signed it into law that would create the first Boolean depository. So in my world, that's a really big deal, right? Because the only um, government-owned Boolean depositories are by the federal government, and that's really Fort Knox and then the storage that we have at West Point and, and, and other places. And so when you have that, um, having a state develop its own depository, in my world, that is radical thinking, radical news, right? And so I met with um, the legislators that uh, put that together to try to get a little bit more insight into what they were trying to do. And it ranges all the way from, you know, uh, uh, parts of Texas government have part of their um, emergency reserves uh, diversified into gold and they wanted a place to repatriate that gold if, if, if they wanted to. Um, a lot of uh, citizens uh, here in Texas own gold and uh, they wanted a, a, a homegrown depository uh, that would be managed in a transparent way. They were also uh, doing some thinking and laying the groundwork for implementing Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution which allows states to declare that gold and silver can be used as legal tender uh, in those states. 
Now, when the Constitution was written, gold and silver was legal tender. Uh, and it didn't matter what country it came from because an ounce of gold was an ounce of gold, an ounce of silver was an ounce of silver. But the problem you had was um, you had to trust the government, right? Uh, uh, Spanish doubloons would be different than uh, English coins, etc. And then because it was the weight that was important, if you needed half a dollar, you would just cut the silver in half right. or a quarter. That's where we get halves and quarters, right? And uh, what the, our founding fathers uh, wanted, and they knew that they needed to do this in order to have a prosperous country, was to unify the currency to be the federal government's responsibility. Uh, but they also realized the value of gold and silver, and they wanted to give states, because uh, you know the um, uh, banks in South Carolina were printing their own currency, and they needed to have it all under one umbrella, so they'd want to take those rights away from the states, mm -hmm. but they had to give the states something, and that was the ability to declare gold and silver legal tender. That has never been implemented mm -hmm. in the United States since written in the Constitution, but uh, since the financial crisis, uh, there's up to 12, maybe 14 states, depending on what, what you consider the status, that are pursuing monetizing uh, gold and silver as uh, as legal tender. Texas is one of them. You know, making use of their advantage or opportunity to preserve that wealth in their own states mm -hmm. um, in case they want to offer anything or make any changes. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Texas has been leading the way with this, with this depository, and I think it's a fantastic addition to moving gold and silver depositories away from the East Coast Yep. and put it more in the central part of America. Absolutely. I think mm -hmm. it's a fantastic yeah. location. Yeah, yeah. So it's a great idea, and it's one that uh, um, uh, U.S. Gold Bureau was uh, given the contract for, and you know, I'm just happy to uh, be a part of that process and collaborate because I think this is uh, more important than just a business opportunity. I mean, it really says a lot about our monetary system mm -hmm. and the uh, integrity of it. And I think this type of thing helps. Right. Well, Ed, I just want to say thank you. This has been a great opportunity to answer some interesting questions about from being the 38th U.S. Mint Director of the United States of America to uh, your involvement with the exclusive autograph signature program with NGC. And we appreciate you, and we enjoyed, I enjoyed my time with you. Well, Miles, uh, the same back to you. To be able to be one of the uh, industry's pioneers, particularly in grading and uh, signature coin series, it's kind of great to meet a legend on the other side uh, also. But uh, and thanks for all the questions. I, you know, Fred Astaire had a famous quote when he was asked, who is your favorite dance partner? And he, you know, politically he couldn't say, but he said, you know, um, I won't say favorite, but I will say this about Sid Charisse. When you've danced with Sid Charisse, you stay danced with. So when I am on the receiving end of questions from you as an interviewer, I stayed interviewed. I mean, we covered a lot it's of a ground. It's a great comparison. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ed.